We're here with Chris Vickery. He is a security researcher uh, who explores the dark regions of the internet to find vulnerabilities and holes. Tell us a little bit about some of your most recent findings. Well, the most recent big one was finding the voter registration records of 191 million registered U.S. voters. And a lot of people say, oh, that's public record, but it's not so black and white or clear as that. A lot of states restrict what you can give out, who you can give it to, and they say you can't make it available to anyone outside of the United States. And this database was totally available to anybody instantly all around the world. So there is a line that was crossed there. Now, what could somebody do with that data? I think the easiest way to explain what you could do, because uh, there's name, phone number, and date of birth included along with address and other voter demographic data, is that you could take the date of birth and you could focus on people that are, say, over 60 or over 70, and you can use the common scams that are used against old people because you've already got all their phone numbers, you've already got the targeted list, you don't have to hit the, the false positives of, oh, I hit a young person that knows technology. No. Your scam, if you're targeting old people, can go straight to them. Mm -hmm. And if you combine it with something like, let's say, the Ashley Madison database breach, you have all sorts of metrics to target people with. You suddenly know, it, because email address is part of that, and not everybody has an email address, but some people do on the registration. So you can tie somebody's name, address, phone number, uh, date of birth to the Ashley Madison database. All of a sudden, you've got cross-references to pull all sorts of extortions. Now, were you contacted by the FBI or CIA, or not CIA, but like Homeland Security, I, that's, anyone? That's actually one thing I can't discuss. I've been oh, okay. told I, I am working with uh, at least one federal agent uh, in regards to that, but I can't say his organization or his name or anything like that. Understand. Um, and with some of the other discoveries, uh, give us an example. You know, Slipknot's there, Hello Kitty's there. Did you... When you found this information, you didn't know what company the database was until you researched it, right? Not immediately. It's not always readily uh, apparent uh, whose data it is. You kind of do a little bit of legwork. You look at what the data is. You look at the IP address. If it's like being hosted in an Amazon cloud instance, it's not so obvious because there's no uh, straight and narrow DNS records. But sometimes it's hosted on like uh, an email server that's, uh, you know, I think iFit was an example of that. They were hosting it uh, on like an email server or something like that just off to the side. So it was an automatic uh, DNS lookup that told me who it was. Sometimes you have to look at the data itself, look at the contact information in there, and kind of call them and ask them if the IP belongs to them. And a lot of the times they'll confirm that it is theirs. And how did you get started doing this? I mean, <laughs> because you, you do have, you know, tell us your IT background, what, what got you into that, and then how did you get started looking for vulner, vulnerabilities in databases? Well, uh, I've always had a knack for computers and technology, just all my life. Uh, for the last five years, I've worked uh, IT tech support at a law firm. And uh, really, the earliest kind of inklings of, of data breach research was uh, a little bit before September of 2015. I came across uh, an open Amazon bucket for a company named Sistema Software. They house uh, private insurance and medical diagnoses and all sorts of uh, court records and everything for uh, various state and government agencies. And uh, it was just pure luck that I came across that. I was just looking at random Amazon S3 buckets, not looking for anything in particular, and I came across that one and realized that's something that needs to get reported, and it made a big news splash. And ever since then, I've just kept an eye out. Now, that's really sensitive data, because yeah. medical privacy laws... HIPAA. Yeah, so how, how did you deal with that? When you, with the second you realized what you had, what did you do with it? I figured out the affected entities. The state of Kansas was one of them. They had their entire workers' comp database up there, uh, social security numbers and everything. And I contacted the state of Kansas, verified that it was their data, and uh, we kind of went from there. I was contacting uh, other agencies. I got in contact with the Texas Attorney General's office because uh, there were Texas people in some of the databases. So I figured it would be good to have local law enforcement involved because I'm based out of Austin. So I ended up giving uh, the hard drive that I downloaded it to to the Texas AG's office. And as far as I know, they're still looking into it. Cool. I mean, that's that's... That's 
really crazy to think about how many databases are vulnerable. How many to date have you found? I've probably come across about 80 uh, open, not not necessarily vulnerable, but just unauthenticated, totally available, being published in the entire world databases that should not be published in that way. Now, if you were going to give advice to, let's say, an IT guy who's responsible for that database, what advice would you give them to troubleshoot or discover the type of vulnerabilities that you find? The easiest way to explain that to people, and I've I've been asked this several times, is assign a little bit of overtime to somebody in your IT department that knows your IP addresses, that knows what servers you host your important stuff on. Get them to go home and try to access it from their home PC. It's really simple, really easy, but that'll find almost 100% of the vulnerabilities, if you want to call it that, that I find. Mm -hmm. It's just if you can reach it from your home, anybody in the world can reach it. If these companies would do that, they'd catch it. Right. It's nothing complex or advanced. So, we all know that with MacKeeper, you, you discovered, uh, give us the process, uh, you know, tell me the process when you discovered uh, the MacKeeper accounts and kind of walk me through the timeline. Well, uh, and, uh, including up to now. <laughs> up to now, okay. So, uh, I don't remember the exact date it was, but uh, I, I came across using Shodan.io, a, a search engine that searches for devices and things that Google doesn't search for. I came across an interesting looking database that had uh, the word Zeobit in it. And uh, I had never heard of Zeobit before, so I looked into it and realized this was account information uh, belonging to somebody. And then I saw all sorts of references to MacKeeper, so I Googled what MacKeeper was. And, you know, Chrome Tech and MacKeeper showed up. And uh, I found uh, a phone number on the MacKeeper website and tried calling it. Unfortunately, I don't know what the what the exact situation was, but I wasn't able to get to a real person through there. So I reached out to the, the Apple subreddit forum on Reddit and said, hey, I've downloaded the information of X million people. Uh, can somebody help me get a hold of these PromTech MacKeeper people so that we can get this secured? And let everybody know that I was not going to be leaking it or spreading it around or anything, which to the ire of a lot of people, they wanted to see what was in it. And then uh, a little bit later, MacKeeper contacted me and uh, asked, you know, what's the IP address, what's the port number, and they were very nice about it. And I provided it to them. I found a couple more IPs that were also exposed. They got them locked down pretty fast. And uh, then they asked me if I wanted to uh, start consulting with them security-wise. After a few days later, I got a call from you, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, that's something I'm very interested in exploring. You know, it's not something I've done really professionally before, but uh, I do have a sort of a knack for it, so why not? And then I got an email a few days after that inviting me to CES, which is where we're at here, uh, to meet up with the MacKeeper people. And uh, it's been fantastic. And the response time was good. They've been very nice to me. They didn't call me a hacker or anything. So that was that was very, very uh, refreshing. And as far as I know, they've upgraded the uh, password algorithms that they're using to uh, store user passwords now so they're not easily crackable. Uh, and they're taking many proactive steps to, to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And before, you were a PC user, and now you're a Mac user. I don't know if I call myself a Mac user. Not I yet. have a Mac. Not yet. Thanks to you guys. Thanks to you guys. I now have a Mac laptop. So I'm going to explore a Mac Keeper and see see uh, how it works and, and what, do I, what I think of it. You know, what do you think about CES? I mean, you know, coming from a tech background, it's your first year here, first time in Vegas. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think? I mean, seeing this much technology, seeing this many new innovations and you know, there's a lot of security stuff here as well what, what's, what's your general impression it's pretty crazy the uh, the amount of people here and, and people sh- and companies showcasing their wares it's overwhelming there's so many people here and so many signs and glowing letters everywhere I mean it's not overwhelming necessarily but it is impressive 